Welcome to Channel's Business Globe with me, Juliana Olayinka from our studios here in London. Over the next half an hour, we'll be looking beyond the business headlines by giving you in-depth perspective on the stories that are affecting all of us. Coming up on today's show, Nigerian migrants face tougher rules on how many relatives they can bring to the UK under the new Home Secretary's plans to cut net migration. Immigration solicitor Jennifer Obaseki will be joining me from here in the capital for a detailed assessment on the British government's controversial plans. And with the presidential election campaign well underway, Grand Nigeria is in the spotlight once again, but sadly not for all the right reasons. Afol Abi Andu, chairman of the Nigerian British Business Forum, will be joining me from Lagos with some insights on how businesses can recapture the narrative and increase investment across the country. Then later, I'll be looking back at some of the biggest business news stories of the week. But first, let's start the show with a story that continues to make headlines here in the UK and across the world. Kwasi Kwarteng, the UK's first black Chancellor of the Exchequer, has been sacked after less than six weeks in the position. He was told the news after his early arrival back in London from IMF talks in Washington this week. His fiscal statement on September the 23rd turned into an economic and political nightmare. The embattled UK Prime Minister Liz Truss held a press conference just hours ago to announce a U-turn on Kwarteng's £43 billion package of unfunded tax cuts in a bid to save her tenure. In other news, British government sources are reporting that the Home Secretary, Suella Braverman, is considering tightening the rules on Nigerian migrants bringing in their dependents to the country after immigration figures showed an alarming inconsistency across different nationalities coming to the UK to study and work. Data shows that Nigerian citizens accounted for 40% of all dependents who accompanied foreign students in the 12 months to June. This was despite Nigerian students making up just 7% of all foreign students over the period. 34,031 Nigerians were given study visas in the UK, and they brought a total of 31,898 dependents with them. In contrast, there were 114,837 Chinese students who came to the UK last year, bringing with them just 401 dependents. Well, for more on this, I'm now being joined by immigration solicitor Jennifer Obaseki. Jennifer Obaseki, thank you so much for joining me on Channel's Business Global. Now, reports are suggesting that the new Home Secretary, Suella Bravman, is planning tougher rules on Nigerian foreign students who are coming into the country with their dependents. Um, can you just break down what exactly is happening for us, please? Well, all of a sudden, you know, this uh, Miss Bravman, she's got this idea that Nigerian dependents are taking up a large portion of migrants into the UK. But, you know, I have a lot of concern with the way she's had these figures presented. Already, Nigerians and other black nations feel that there is a level of, let me say, stigma at times or unfair treatment towards us. And to solely single out Nigerian dependents, I think, is very, very much so unfair. The statistics, we don't know how they've been compiled. And we're also coming off the back of COVID, where we saw a lot of our family members come in ordinarily on visits, but the world changed. And they you know, were not able to go back to Nigeria and live independently. The other thing is, the way it's, the story's been portrayed, again, is very negative and rather adverse towards Nigerians. At the end of the day, these are people who have come into the UK legally, have applied for their family members to come and join them quite legally. And we're a large nation, one of the biggest nations in the world. So we're going to represent in large numbers in any statistical compilation that you formulate, you know. But the way it has been presented is very much so unfair. It, it needs to be, um, let me say, more holistically explained and not put in such an adverse light. Once again, these are legal migrants who have paid for family members to come and join them legally. I think it's a really good point, Jennifer, that you raised about uh, these um, you know, migrants are legal 
they're legal foreign students. They've come here legally uh, with their dependents legally. Um, and yeah, there has been a bit of scaremongering, um, which you would get with some of the far right press here in uh, the UK. But a lot of people are worried. It's been doing the rounds on WhatsApp, as would be expected. And of course, it's been picked up by all media um, across Nigeria. And if you just look at the headline isolated, Jen, you would think that this is a typical racist Tory policy, but it's not because if you look at the polls, um, only 29% of Tory uh, voters um, agree with a reduction um, in foreign students. So why do you think that Nigerians have been, you know, unfairly oh. highlighted? However, I must say she's also upset India uh, by uh, pointing out that Indian students are the most likely to overstay their visa. You see, with the Indian um, headline or, or rhetoric, the problem that you have is where Indian couples give birth in the United Kingdom, they have a limited window in which to register the birth of their children. Otherwise, the Indian um, immigration rules means that that child will not actually be given Indian nationality. So there has been that cycle of the number of um, legal migrants, again, from India into the UK, who end up having to overstay because they have to keep their um, children in the UK because the children can't get British pass, can't get Indian passports or Indian nationality. But again, how this is being put and not with the necessary explanation so that people who read the headline understand the full story is, again, unfair. It, it, it's, it gives that little bit of um, dermongering amongst the, let me say, the racists in society. Again, apart from students, you have that invitation from the British government to come and fill up the short skill gaps in the UK. You, so many um, Nigerian nationals came in in response to the healthcare worker visas, were on the front line during COVID. The UK also has the highest cost, one of the highest costs in children's care um, provision in the, in the world. So family members, the family unit is part of African culture, part of Nigerian culture. So to have the family, extended family, close in so that they live as a unit is part of our culture. And as human beings living just in another country doesn't mean we forget our culture. So if those family members can come in legally, help secure that nuclear family and have that quality of life legally, why are we now being sort of sectioned out for it? Um, once again, the Home Office hasn't outlined the amount that we have raised in revenue within these application fees. These applications are not cheap. <laughs> and once again, apart from our economic contribution in student fees, apart from our economic contribution as workers, um, the fact that we are also raising revenue for the Home Office in our application fees, that's all left out of the headline. <laughs> uh, only the negative put forward, which, as I say, is completely unfair. Um, before I let you go, uh, Jen, uh, you know, the Nigerian uh, brain drain um, is in full flow um, at the moment. It, it ebbs and flows, but it really is uh, rushing uh, right now. We know a lot of Nigerians are heading to Canada. It seems as if Justin Trudeau's opened uh, those borders uh, with open arms. What's the state of migration to Britain at the moment? What kind of cases are you seeing? Is it the land of milk and honey, which we know it's not, uh, but some people would like to think um, it is. Um, is it easy to get here? You know, can we can we have some uh, free legal advice at the moment? Well, absolutely. Uh, we've been well. Personally, I've been doing immigration work for over twenty-two years, and within our practice, eighteen years of immigration specialism and other routes, family, um, property, but. These streets are not paved with gold. You're quite right. There is no money tree in the back of everybody's garden. It's hard work. And yes, there's been a large response to the healthcare worker call out by the UK and the other areas that um, there's a short uh, labor shortage or skill shortage in the UK. However, it is hard work. Cost of living is extremely high. Um, we appreciate the fact that Nigeria does then 
in response suffer from brain drain. A lot of graduates leaving uh, Nigeria looking for greener pastures elsewhere. But there are opportunities in Nigeria, first of all. Um, there's the digital economy. Lots of people should realize there are opportunities and jobs they can engage in online. They don't have to leave Nigeria. Yeah. But there is that shortage. We need doctors to do in-person diagnostics, doctors, um, psychologists in Nigeria to do those levels of um, uh, assessments for people that are in need. So there has to be a balance. I would say that there could be visa routes that are, the Nigerian government should look at that are attractive and encourage people to return home at the end of a period abroad. But definitely, it's not as rosy as some people may think. It's not just the UK that is a destination of choice, as you quite rightly said. Many are going to Canada, Australia, UAE. Um, many people come here and realise the cost of living and quality of life is not as they expected and then leave and go to the places like UAE or Canada where uh, they're actually offering quite higher salaries in comparison to what's being offered here in the UK. We've run out of time, which is such a shame because, of course, this is um, a, a topic that um, I could say more, probably over 100 million Nigerians um, want to know, um, you know, an answer to. Um, and we're going to have to pick this up again because it is of significant um, importance, I'm sure, uh, for us all. Jennifer Obaseki, solicitor and founder of Obaseki Solicitors, thank you so much for your time and advice. Free, of course. Thank you, Jen. Let's change gears now to focus on the labour market. Nearly half of adults living in the UK struggled to pay their energy bills last month, and 90% reported an increase in the overall cost of living. With over 4 million freelancers in the UK, it's considered by some as being one of the most affected demographics with the worst job security. Well, for more on this, let's speak with Glenn Hodgson, the CEO of think tank Free Trade Europa. Glenn joins me from Stockholm. Glenn Hodgson, it is always a pleasure to have you on Channels Business Global. And it is cheeky to ask, but, you know, you are a friend of the show now. Um, you've been working on the Future of Work Study 2022, the voice of freelancers. Incredibly important because millions of them have had no voice. And we are going through a significant cost of living crisis, not just here, across the world. Could you please share just a little bit of insight on what this data is likely to reveal? Absolutely, Juliana. Very, really happy to be here and to give you a bit of a sneak peek of what's coming up. And I think the big thing that comes out of this is the is, is the demographics we're talking about here. There's uh, it's an older demographic than uh, people normally talk about when talking about freelancing, gig work, and platform work. With uh, 55% of uh, individuals being over 30 years of age, and also uh, a number having a quite high. Uh, level of education. Mm -hmm. uh, in the study that we carried out, 60% had a, a, a university degree and over 20% were earning between 2,000 and 5,000 euros a month. But at the same time, we saw there was some, uh, some, some issues there as well. Given the cost of living crisis, as you quite rightly uh, raised there, Juliana, 33% of freelancers are actually struggling to find work and to be able to pay their bills at the moment as well. Uh, symptomatic of the society at the moment, but somewhere where the you know, the decision makers, policy makers need to be able to have an eye on these individuals and maybe fall outside the, the traditional nine to five uh, framework. But what we're seeing from the, uh, the, the anecdotal, but also the, the data is that this is becoming more uh, attractive than ever before oh. for the simple reason that people want to have flexibility, they want to have choice, and they want to have the, the, the ability to decide when and where they work. Glenn Hodgson, CEO of Free Trade Europa. Always such a pleasure speaking with you on the show. Thanks, Glenn. In a moment, I'll be speaking with Afolabi Andu, chairman of the Nigerian British Business Forum. But until then, here's a breakdown of the biggest business news stories of the week. Heathrow has regained its title as Europe's busiest airport. This is despite its well-documented summer of travel misery. Almost 6 million passengers travelled through its terminals in September, even though demand is still 15% lower than before the pandemic. Last year, Heathrow was placed 10th in the list, blaming coronavirus travel rules for its position. But between July and September this year, the airport was busier than rivals in cities such as Paris, Amsterdam, Frankfurt and Madrid. 
Russia has added Facebook owner Meta to its list of extremist and terrorist organizations. The list, compiled by Rosfin Monitoring, a federal body overseen by President Vladimir Putin, includes organizations and individuals with regard to which there is information about their involvement in extremist activities or terrorism. The latest move could land Russian citizens and companies in jail for up to 10 years on charges of sponsoring extremism if they purchase ads on Facebook or Instagram. This is according to the Moscow Times. Elon Musk claims to have sold more than 10,000 bottles of a new perfume he has launched called Burnt Hair, earning him over a million dollars in just a few hours. The world's richest man introduced the fragrance to the world via Twitter last month, and he describes the smell like leaning over a candle at a dinner table. This latest endeavor continues the Tesla CEO's tradition of touting products as jokes before turning them into goods that become highly sought after by his army of fans. To our final topic now, with a presidential election just a few months away, the world is turning its gaze towards Africa's largest economy. Nigeria is without a doubt a significant player in geopolitics, but it's clear that persistent roadblocks have to be removed if we are to attain the stamp of approval that is needed to advance our prosperity. Well, for more on this, let's now speak with Afolabi Andu, chairman of the Nigerian British Business Forum. Mr. Afolabi joins me from Lagos. Mr. Afolabi Andu, thank you so much for taking your time out to join me on Channels Business Global. You recently conducted your annual Nigeria British Business Forum. Channels Business Global had exclusive access. I've got to say, you did have a lot of um, big hitters there, uh, but it took place at a time when I would say Nigeria's perception across the globe is waning slightly. It does ebb and flow, but I think there is a lot of attention on Nigeria at the moment, of course, because we are Africa's largest economy. Uh, the elections that are taking place in February, the world will be watching. What are, would you say, some of the stumbling blocks that are stopping Nigeria from having that stamp of approval, which we deserve to have? Well, first of all, let me thank you, uh, Juliana, for inviting me to be on the program uh, this morning. And yes, following the Nigerian Global Economic Summit, I think it's important for the viewers to also appreciate the reason why we did host that event. Uh, it wasn't really for uh, a local point of interest in terms of um, uh, gathering uh, businesses or professionals within Nigeria but it was from a global perspective. Just to let it be very clear that we have a significant number of Nigerian professionals, entrepreneurs, who equally are major stakeholders within the whole entity called Nigeria. And they do want to have their say. Uh, they want to provide some form of uh, support in terms of uh, economic direction, in terms of investment, in terms of expertise input. So that was the real uh, essence of hosting the event. Now, secondly, just to re respond to that concern that has just been presented in terms of um, investors uh, taking a, a keen look at Nigeria at this point in time. Of course, it's not news. We all know exactly what our issues are. You know, um, we know that the issues of security is a major factor. We also know that uh, corruption is at an industrial scale, and it's really not news to any, any of us. But despite all that, what I think is really the biggest bane uh, in terms of us being able to convey our message in the most effective way is our poor communication strategy. Mm. Now, the world, as we see, all know today, is going through a lot of challenges. There is a war going on uh, between uh, Russia and Ukraine. It's impacted severely on the world economy. Yeah. And let's be honest with ourselves. The, any big economy will be looking for a way out. How can we scale up in spite of all these issues? The United Kingdom is going through possibly the worst economic situation for many, many, many years. And we also know that the issue of the energy crisis is one major factor. 
But we have all that it takes in Nigeria to break the gap. So it's about posture. Juliana, to me, my view is that it's about our posture. It's about our leadership posture. If we can engender confidence by the stance that we take, whether it's in terms of our policy, our economic policy direction, or in terms of just allaying fears and just giving assurance that we are working very hard at making sure that all those points of concern are being addressed. I can guarantee you that not only would we start to experience uh, some form of interest in the country, but commitment. But saying that also, as I uh, conclude on your question, there is movement. The, the companies, foreign companies, are looking at Nigeria closely. And they're looking at Nigeria not just on small-scale investment, but on medium to large-scale investment. So it's, it's relatively all good. We've spoken on this program extensively about uh, the importance of the diaspora. And I think, you know, the remittance figures speak for themselves, don't they? Uh, but then do you think it's fair to say that sometimes Nigerian policymakers have this kind of love-hate relationship with the diaspora? On one hand, you know, we, we love the income, um, we love the ideas. But on the other hand, don't push too much. Don't go past your boundaries because this isn't Britain, this isn't America, this isn't Singapore. Um, how can we make that relationship work better, in your opinion? Well, you know, I think it really starts off by us, first of all, agreeing that we are a part of one major corporate entity. So if we can, in our mind, you know, psychologically recognize that every single Nigerian, whether you're in the diaspora, whether you are home-based, the interest has got to be on a focal point of Nigeria, to make Nigeria that great nation that we all desire, that nation that we dream to be effectively a leader within the League of Nations worldwide. Now, once that is established, particularly uh, between the uh, the key groups, the leadership in the country, as well as those in the diaspora, uh, the bridge will start to be more effective. Yeah. So we would not see uh, those who are abroad as them or that lot. And in the same manner, uh, those who are out here will not start feeling sense of apprehension when they're looking to venture uh, out here in Nigeria. The bottom line at the end of the day is the interest. If the interest is about Nigeria, those issues will not even be considered at all. Yes. We know that you know the great nations of the world are that largely in the diaspora. You know whether it's in India, whether it's in uh, the, 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 the uh, um, Brazil, whether it's in Israel. A lot of the people who have supported development are out there in the diaspora. We need each other. We all need each other. Uh, mm -hmm. Those who are out there in the diaspora, possibly by virtue of exposure, they've gained some more uh, knowledge in terms of 21st century um, um, uh, standards. And these are things that we need, whether it's in our health sector, whether it's in education, whether it's in our agribusiness, all sectors. We need to be at par. We need to be recognized as a 21st century environment. Afolabi. Andu, Chairman, Nigerian British Business Forum. I could go on and on uh, with those titles, but I think you'll allow me to just use that one for now. Thank you so much for joining me on Channels Business Global. We look forward to having you in the studio sometime soon. Thank you. My pleasure. Thanks. Well, sadly, that's all we have time for today. But as always, please do get in touch with your comments and suggestions. I'll see you at the same time next week for more in-depth business analysis on Channels Business Global. Goodbye.